an eighth special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. An artist and entertainer produces paintings with breathtaking speed. The cool thing about what I do is it's like children looking at clouds. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Magritte sought to reveal the mystery that he believed to be latent in every object. A glass blower adds an emotional touch to her creations. The moment of truth comes and I just shut up and I listen to whatever is inside and it says, take it or leave it. And a refurbished tapestry reveals wonderful colors never seen before. It was cleaned, it had this heavy gray pallor of particulate soils all over it that have now been removed. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. After a desperate bid for financial relief became a global phenomenon, artist Dan Dunn explores how his unique method of painting earned him the respect and admiration of millions. I said, well, I'm gonna... I was upside down on my credit cards trying to pay for kids, uh, five children, and we were trying to figure out how we were gonna get them to college. My wife, she said, what are, we, what are we gonna do? I said, well, I'm gonna rent a mini warehouse and I've got this idea and I'm gonna throw some paint. I draped it in plastic. I rehearsed for a year and a half and then I had my first show for 4th of July. And I uh, did Statue of Liberty in a minute and a half and the crowd just went crazy. I built a web page and it attracted the attention of a Las Vegas producer. And he had a show in Atlantic City. So we painted Ray Charles and Lady Liberty every night. Three months after that, he sent me the video and I was able to post it on YouTube. We were getting uh, 85,000 views an hour, and it was just insane. All of a sudden, our life was changed, and people were hiring us. We'd get 30 to 50 offers a day to play all over the world. American artist, Dun Dun. The first year, we did 100 cities in 11 countries. I've got over 150 pieces in my repertoire now from doing the custom, so it keeps me growing all the time. Uh, when I do a piece, I get images off the web, and I study them, I put them into Photoshop, I make sure they look good this big, and I make sure they look good from the back of the room. Then I take them out, and then I start practicing, and I learn them right side up, and then I learn them upside down and I memorize the shapes, because I've got to get up on stage and hit everything I need just with the shapes. And then I choreograph it to music for uh, emotional impact. The cool thing about what I do is it's like children looking at clouds. You know, you, uh, you try to guess what it is, and I try to hide it as long as I can. And you guess and you guess and you guess, and then I show you. It's either what you guessed or it's something different. And if I can surprise you and show you something different, the emotional impact that happens is like electricity, like a magic trick, and goes to the audience. And that's what turns me on. I consider myself an artist. I went to art school, but I'm also an entertainer. I consider myself an entertainer more because I have to be on stage. I have to have nerves of steel up there. I have to have confidence. And uh, I was also a musician for 10 years. I played in a garage band for 10 years. I played guitar. So all of these things, uh, being a caricaturist, doing wax on, wax off, uh, five minute drawings for events for 30 years, 
this is kind of the culmination of everything I've been working on my whole life. And I'm just having the time of my life. You can find out more about Dan Dunn's unique style and see examples of his work at paintjam.com. For the first time ever, select works by the Belgian surrealist René Magritte have been brought to the U.S. to tour the country. We get an inside look from curator Anne Umland at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. This is the first major museum exhibition of Magritte's work in New York City to be held in over a generation. And it is the very, very first ever to look at how and when did Magritte become Magritte. The title of the exhibition, Magritte, The Mystery of the Ordinary, 1926 to 1938, began with a phrase that Magritte's close friend and contemporary, a Belgian surrealist, Paul Nouget, said about Magritte's work in 1931. To look at Magritte's paintings and to turn away from them again and to confront the world itself was to find that reality had been altered. There are no longer any ordinary things. Magritte sought to reveal the mystery that he believed to be latent in every object. And so we ended up putting those two words together, mystery and ordinary, because I think with Magritte, he's always creating works that go back and forth between things that are so recognizable and nameable, and yet he makes them deeply mysterious. Magritte has a rather unique background in that he trained both in a fine arts academy and as a commercial artist. I think this kind of bold, graphic, legible, identifiable clarity that he achieves in his painting surely is informed by a commercial background. For me, the beauty of doing a show that is a slice like this, that's sort of this intensely innovative 13-year period, is that you get to go in depth. The exhibition in its most basic is chronological. The Lost Jockey is one of a whole group of collages that Magritte made in 1926 and 1927. It combines a number of Magritte's early techniques and images and types of materials. So there are these strange forms that look a little bit like chess pieces that Magritte called bilboquet. And in English, the word bilboquet refers to a child's cup and ball toy. There's also in this picture the idea of the stage, the curtains open on either side. He's telling us this is some magical surreal place. The central element is this charcoal drawn figure of a horse and jockey. And Magritte's friends at that moment identified that figure with the artist himself sort of galloping off into the unknown of the avant-garde. Surrealism was a movement that was founded by a Paris poet named André Breton in 1924. And at its essence, it asked people to take nothing for granted. And I think that whole idea that behind ordinary, everyday appearances, there is always another reality or surreality is just key to understanding Magritte's larger project of defamiliarizing the familiar or helping us to look at the world around us with fresh eyes. The treachery of images is probably Magritte's most direct interrogation of what it means to make a picture and what the act of representation entails. He presents you with this absolutely legible image of a pipe, and then underneath it, in sort of school boy or girl script, writes, ceci n'est pas une pipe. This is not a pipe. 
then that immediately sort of throws everything up into question. Neither words nor pictures are ever the same as the things themselves. They are just conventions. There are a number of works in this show that have never been seen in the United States before. Among them, for instance, not to be reproduced, this anti-portrait from 1937 of Magritte's great patron, the eccentric British collector, Edward James. All the different themes that you see throughout the show of doubling and repetition and mirroring and concealment, I think are so beautifully encapsulated in this portrait. And just to keep things from being too obvious, the book by Edgar Allan Poe, who was one of Magritte's favorite authors, is reflected in the conventional way in the mirror. So right away you have these two contradictory systems and the more you look, the more that you see things that don't add up. Magritte's captivating creations are currently touring the country. Michelle Kaptur composes beautiful blown glass pieces with inspiration from an unlikely source, her dog. Reporter Katrina Sarson learns how Kaptur goes beyond the traditional notions of art and infuses a sense of personal connection into every creation. We're just outside Bend at the studio of glassblower Michelle Kaptur. She's working with her dog Sarah on agility skills while the furnace heats up. She says it's all part of her creative process. When I work with Sarah, I have to totally focus on my body, what I'm doing, because she's reading everything I, the way I move, that's how I direct her around here. These are the weave poles behind me. I'll tell you, it took, I don't know, a year to train her to do that. Oh, yay, good girl. But the first time she went through them straight, it was like, wow! I was beside myself. Um, she was a pretty happy girl about it all. Free, over. But what does all this have to do with blowing glass? In the studio, I'm inviting the glass to become my vision. And uh, it's a working process where I say, let's do this, and it says, mm, okay, or no, maybe this. But out here, she's ready. She's looking at me. Those eyes are ready. She is inviting me to be a part of her. I kind of get to be her glass in a way. Her elegant blown glass pieces showcase light and design. Michelle's other work, though, is a little different. Colorful glass memorial pieces called soul bursts. A soul burst is a, a piece of commemorative glass that I make. It has someone's ashes in it or a pet. I think it's part of the grieving process. Today, she's creating a soul burst to honor a client's brother. This is a starting point for me. It's not a road map, but it's the beginning of a trail. It helps me wake up and go, yeah, how about those colors? I like those colors. These are what the ashes look like. People will mail me about a teaspoon of ash, and I put it on my marber, and I collect it. And there is a point where we will roll the glass in it, and it will stick to the glass and that's on top of the color generally afterwards. And then I put clear glass over it and create the shapes. The eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 marked the first time Michelle used ash in a glass piece. 
we collected some Mount St. Helens ash and I created a piece that was like a little painting. It had a mountain in the foreground and it physically had ash coming out of it and a little full moon and you could feel the ash on the surface. Michelle discovered the art of blowing glass in 1975 at Alder House, a glass blowing studio in Lincoln City. And I walked into that studio and I was totally mesmerized by the glass in the process and you know, it was like an addiction. It just happened right then and there. Mark Gordon is Michelle's studio assistant. They've worked together for the past few years. Basically, my job is to facilitate and give her a second set of hands and eyes, and she comes up with an idea, gives her the ability to step her work up to the highest level it can be. I do all this planning, I play, I fiddle around. But then the moment of truth comes and I just shut up and I listen to whatever is inside and it says, take it or leave it. And I will take it or leave it. lot of fun to blow glass with somebody, to do, to work as a team and to create something bigger than what you could make all by yourself. It's magical. I like this one. See how much more the ashes are a fluid part of it, that, that whitish bubbly area. Now they really get to dance. Michelle usually mails the Solbers to a client. Today, though, a nearby friend has stopped by to pick hers up. Are you ready? I'm ready. It contains ashes from her mother. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's just, it's light, and that's what's, that's what's important to me. Um, the thing I love about your glass in my home and in these is that your glass relates to the light. And I can't think of any better way to have my mom or others that I love than in the light. Exactly. So thank you. That is beautiful. It's just a bit of joy. That would, my mom would like that. <laughs> Michelle's glass work to me is a creation of light because I've watched her blow it and I've watched essentially fire and light come together from some small thing into some amazing piece. The soul burst is a perfect thing for her to do. It is a burst of light. It, it is light holding, in this case, something very special. Every day we get to come in and we get to work with a wonderful material, hot glass, and create beautiful colored objects. Um, they can be very complex or very simple. So it's actually quite amazing to create something with your hands and have something live on longer than you. And to be a part of it is, is very exciting. What I'm really doing is trying to create the prettiest little painting in that little spot in a way that's going to be beautiful and that's going to give you joy when you look at it. And that's hard because it's gonna be really sad at first, but I want it to be a celebration. To explore more of Michelle Captor's creations, visit soulbursts.com. Finally, for the first time in nearly half a century, the tapestries within the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, Massachusetts have been cleaned and restored. It was an exhaustive seven-month process, but the resulting splendor of these refurbished 16th century Flemish creations is more dazzling than ever imagined. Jared Bowen gives us a look. One of the grandest spaces in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is the soaring 4,000 square foot tapestry room. Opened in 1914 to house tapestries Mrs. Gardner collected over 35 years, it was also one of the first spaces the museum turned to after opening its new wing. This room has just been refurbished, bringing this room back to the glory of, of what it once was. 
The museum treated paintings, returned the tile floor to its original shine, improved the lighting, and completely restored its 14th century French fireplace. Perhaps most daunting, though, was the cleaning of its long-soiled 16th century Flemish tapestries like this one. It hasn't been cleaned since the 60s, and at that particular time we were, there were still fires in the fireplace and we were still burning um, coal, so it was a rather sooty environment. So we need to remove some of those soot. Tess Fredette is the textile conservator at the Gardner Museum. We met with her last October as she prepped the tapestry for cleaning. It's being sent all the way to Belgium. Correct. So is the, that's the nearest place that you can go. You can't obviously take this to Zoots. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, well, this is actually, the reason why we're going to do it in Belgium is because of, they have this sort of state-of-the-art cleaning system that I believe is the wave of the future. But first, one of the museum's most fragile masterpieces had to be removed and rolled. It's more nerve-wracking a little bit because as a, a piece of cloth, it's very flexible. And so we want to be careful not to bend it, although once it curls onto the floor, it'll bend. So you have to make sure that it's really a gentle handling. Okay. Okay, so okay. Passing, it, passing it down to you. Here. Okay. All right. Okay. Got it. Oops. No. And then we'll just get it unwound as soon as we can. Over the fall and winter, the museum sent four tapestries to Belgium for high-tech cleaning. The result was a revelation, as we saw when we met up with Fredette again seven months later. This is almost a new tapestry, isn't it? It certainly is. It's um, so much brighter. It was cleaned. It had this heavy gray pallor of particulate soils all over it that have now been removed. And they put the tapestry on this big suction table and then they have this aerosol system in the ceiling that just slowly releases this mist and they turn on the suction underneath and so they draw it, very slowly draw it through the tapestry and so the soils come with it. Did you see the what the soil was like? I mean, yes. what, what was yes. that like? It was very black. <laughs> The clarity of the imagery has improved. The colors that were hidden beneath that grayness have popped forward. With the tapestry laid out in the museum's conservation lab, Fredette says there are elements of the work, a hair laid bare, that she didn't even know existed. But the hair is outlined on one side with a dark brown and on the other side with a navy blue, which really adds to that. It gives it a little bit more dimension. And that's not something that we could see before. And with the tapestries returned to their space and pristine once more, the entire room is something generations have not seen before. To learn more about the museum, visit GardnerMuseum.org. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Art Beat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.